I am Lauren Summers. I am Senior Director of Lifelong Learning and Travel at the Yale Alumni Association. And I'm your host for today's climate change conversation. I wanna thank all of you for joining this installment of our climate change conversation series. It's being sponsored by our colleagues at Harvard Alumni Travels. And we're pleased to feature a number of speakers who have connections to both Yale and to Harvard as well as distinguished faculty from both universities. Uh, together, we've organized nine discussions for our collective alumni communities, each fe uh, featuring experts across a wide range of topics relevant to climate change. All of the lectures will be recorded and available to view on the Yale Alumni Academy and Harvard Alumni Travel websites. The next conversation that's coming up will be held on Wednesday, November 10th from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And the topic is Climate Crisis and Clean Energy with Robert Klee, who is a professor at the Yale School of the Environment. And right after that, the following day on Thursday, November 11th, we will have Professor Paul Turner from the Yale School of Medicine speaking on the effects of climate change on virus emergence. Now for today, I'm very pleased to introduce our distinguished guest, Ambroise Brenier, who is Senior Natural Resources Management Specialist at the World Bank. He's based in Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, for those of you who just joined, I mentioned earlier, Ambroise has very kindly uh, gotten up at 6.30 in the morning to do this presentation for us because he is in Indonesia right now. So we're very grateful to him um, for extending his time. His Yale connection is that he's a 2020 Maurice R. Greenberg World Fellow from the Yale Jackson Institute. He has a PhD in marine biology from the Sorbonne University. And prior to joining the World Bank in 2021, Ambroise served as country director for wildlife for the Wildlife Conservation Society in Papua New Guinea. He and his team were working with the government and hundreds of indigenous communities around the country to triple Papua New Guinea's marine protected areas coverage, preserve intact forests, promote the sustainable use of natural resources, and improve people's livelihoods. Now, prior to this role, he led the Wildlife Conservation Society's marine conservation efforts in Madagascar, in early years, Ambroise also served as the program manager for a Swiss-based foundation dedicated to the protection of marine life and coastal livelihoods in West Africa. And he studied coral reefs and coastal fisheries in New Caledonia, French Polynesia, and Madagascar as part of his master's and PhD research. Thank you so much, Ambroise, for joining us today. I'm going to disappear and let you do your presentation. I just want to remind everyone, if you have questions for Ambrose, we will have time for Q&A after his presentation. Please just post your questions in the Q&A box. All right, over to you, Ambrose. Thank you, Lorraine, for the introduction. I'm very pleased to be with all of you this morning, this evening. Um, so bring back great memories to, to be back with a group of people from Yale. Uh, I was uh, in Harvard, but I was in, in, in Yale, uh, in New Haven last year, uh, while, while doing this uh, World Fellow Fellowship. Uh, and uh, that, that was really, really good time to interact with students and faculty and the other fellows. So I had really amazing time with, um, with the Yale community one year ago. So it, it's great to be uh, back with uh, some of you. Um, also great to be back um, uh, to talk about Papua New Guinea. So I left Papua New Guinea, we left uh, with the family Papua New Guinea about five months ago, um, but talking and, and when I was preparing the presentation, it, it brought back a lot of uh, memory and great time we had there. It's a, such a, an amazing country and great program. And I had a chance to, 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 to lead there. So. I'm really happy to be able to talk about Papua New Guinea with, with you. And great to see that several people actually know the country, which is kind of rare, or have been there, because it's, it's quite remote and not so many people actually uh, go there. Uh, so really, really good to see that uh, lots of people with experience in Papua New Guinea. I will share my screen now. Um, one second, please.
So I was the, um, so uh, as mentioned, Lauren, so I'm currently working with the World Bank on an uh, oceans issue in Indonesia, and I'm based in Jakarta. But uh, until early 2021, and for almost five years, we were, I was living with the family in Papua New Guinea, the highlands of Papua New Guinea, actually, in Goroka, uh, where the headquarter of the Wildlife Conservation Society is. Uh, and I was the, the country director there, so leading the, the program um, uh, about 60 staff uh, working in different parts of the country with the government uh, and, all, and mostly with the local communities, indigenous groups to help uh, them uh, manage better their natural resources, basically, uh, forest and marine. So a lot of the work we were doing is um, to support uh, strengthen community-based natural resource management. Um, so it's not directly a climate change presentation, but obviously all this work was um, basically building nature-based solution to climate change through uh, mitigation and adaptation solutions uh, on the ground with the communities and, and the government. So the, the Wildlife Conservation Society, you're probably familiar with it, it's an international conservation group. Um, it's headquartered in uh, New York. Um, um, it's managing the Bronx Zoo, it's managing the Central Park Zoo, New York Aquarium, etc. Uh, but it also has, um, it's also running feed conservation program all around the world, mostly in developing countries uh, around the tropics, with country program, uh, and, and one of them being Papua New Guinea. I guess one of the key characteristics of the Wildlife Conservation Society, in addition to being field-based, science-based, is that it invests, invests over the long term. So it builds relationship with local government, national government, local communities in the landscape and seascape uh, where uh, WCS operates. Um, and I believe that what gave, um, gave the strength of this organization because by working over the long term, building this trust, this relationship, you actually be in a position to um, deliver on conservation and, and achieve uh, sustained conservation outcomes uh, in these landscape and seascapes. So Papua New Guinea, um, quite far for, for, for us, I, I come from France uh, and for people from US, I imagine too. Um, the, the, so it's part of uh, New Guinea Island, so the Eastern part of New Guinea Island, it's just north of Australia. It's actually the second largest island um, on earth. Uh, it's very famous for its uh, biodiversity. Um, so it was the third largest tropical rainforest uh, after Congo and Amazon, after Amazon and Congo. Um, it also, so in, the, in this forest, you can find more than 13,000 different plant species, two thirds of which being endemic. So you cannot find anywhere else on, on the planet. Uh, there's also amazing uh, wildlife, uh, most famous for the birds of paradise. So, in New Guinea Island, you can find actually more than 8% of all the bird species in the world. Um, but it's also famous for its cultural diversity. So the map at the bottom is the different languages that are spoken in uh, New Guinea Island. So on the Indonesia side and on the Papua New Guinea side, uh, there's more than 900 different languages that are spoken by more than uh, 1,000 different indigenous groups. And each one of these indigenous groups, they have their own tradition, or culture, own custom, uh, and, and own language. Um, maybe one, one other aspect uh, is that 80% of the population is actually uh, living a rural, in a rural lifestyle, so um, very much depending on natural resources for their um, livelihoods from the sea and from the forest. Um, so very famous for biodiversity and for cultural diversity. Um, also the water surroundings of Papua New Guinea are very rich. Um, they are part of the coral triangle, the epicenter of marine biodiversity in the world. Um, so really important place for to work uh, in for NGO like Wildlife Conservation Society and also obviously. Um, those natural resources and uh, them are under threat. Um, so Main threat is actually over harvesting, um, both in the forest and in the sea, um, basically because of uh, a growing population. Um, and also logging uh, is, is one of the main threats for forests. A um, lot of the logging happening in Papua New Guinea is, is illegal, actually. Um, 
And then agriculture, uh, not that big compared, for instance, to Indonesia, but growing. So palm oil is 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 part of the is is also uh, um, leading to deforestation. Um, and finally, on top of those threats, you also have the impact of climate change uh, in the country. I hope you can still hear me fine because I got the internet connection and stable message, but just let me know that if you can't hear me anymore. Um, Papua New Guinea, uh, climate change. Actually, the Papua New Guinea is really famous for being the first country in the world where climate refugees have been uh, identified. Uh, sm small atolls in part uh, of offshore Bougainville, um, low-lying atolls that lost 50% of their land of the past um, uh, few decades. Uh, that's where the first climate refugees have been identified. Um, and climate change, uh, as in many parts of the world, uh, leads to uh, more severe um, uh, destructive weather events, flooding, uh, sea level rise, bleaching, uh, persistent growth, um, saltwater intrusion into the agricultural land, um, etc. Uh, one of the project uh, um, the team uh, was doing, uh, we were leading in Papua New Guinea, was to actually document some of these stories, some of these impact that people were, um, were uh, some some of the climate change impact stories that the, that that was affecting the livelihoods of some of these people around the the, the Papua New Guinea. That's what you can see on this story map um, with the link on the top right um, of your screen um, with a lot of uh, many different um, people on the coast or inland that are talking about how climate change is actually impacting their daily livelihood, daily life. Another example is this, uh, this uh, paper on the bottom, uh, which shows that 63% of endemic plant species are expected to have a smaller geographic range by uh, 2070 due to climate change. Uh, and it's not only a biodiversity issue, but also a cultural and, and, and livelihood issue because actually seven, more than 700 of these endemic plant species are used by indigenous uh, people. So a really important place to work, lots of um, uh, threats currently to the natural resources, uh, biodiversity and livelihoods of the people. Some of the challenge of working in Papua New Guinea. So it's a really high, it's really costly place to operate um, any project, any program and, and conservation um, project too, uh, because there's not so much infrastructure. So it's really challenging to move from one place to the, to the other. Most of the, most of the sites and communities are really, really uh, remote and challenging to access to. Um, corruption is an issue, um, lack of, uh, environment and natural resources and environment uh, not being a priority for the government. Um, most of the efforts are actually focusing on the extractive industry, mining, logging. Um, but you probably, you will probably say that it's uh, similar to what's happening in many, similar context to many developing countries where biodiversity hotspots are found. Um, probably the key characteristics characteristic uh, specificity of Papua New Guinea is the land ownership. So 97% of the land is under customary ownership uh, on land, but also on coastal seas are owned by different groups of uh, people, um, indigenous groups. And I told, I told you that um, there's so many, so many of those groups, each tribe, uh, so more than 1,000 tribe, each tribe uh, there's, um, uh, subdivided in clans, each clan subdivided in subclans, each subclan uh, divided in family. Sometimes the land ownership is at the family level, sometimes subclan or clan level. Uh, but you basically have so many of these groups who have ownership and different customs, um, different rules, uh, different governance structure over uh, a small part of the land. So just to give you an example, uh, zooming in the highlands, uh, center of, uh, of Papua New Guinea, you can see that uh, land ownership um, is owned by so many different peoples, which makes any land aggregation or large scale conservation projects quite challenging because you need to, uh, you need to engage uh, meaningfully with so many groups. Uh, another challenge is that this land is not registered uh, and also uh, the, so there's no paperwork uh, and also the, the, the land boundary are not surveyed. Um, not demarcated. 
not known, um, at least on paper, they are known by the people, but they, and it's also led to a lot of disputes uh, between neighboring tribes and clans. Uh, so yeah, there's still a lot of uh, tribal fighting, uh, fighting happening in Papua New Guinea. The main reason is uh, um, conflict over uh, land ownership uh, and land boundaries. Another challenge is uh, that I, I was surprised to find out when I was there from, uh, is the, despite being an hotspot for biodiversity, for culture, so important place, um, and, and the, the, the philanthropic foundation, the private foundations that are actually, that usually are investing in those places, or so for instance, in neighboring countries, um, you can find a lot of uh, philanthropic foundation investing in conservation, uh, like Indonesia and Fiji, but not so much in Papua New Guinea. Um, so, and philanthropic foundations, they usually provide you with uh, uh, flexible um, funding that are easier to implement that uh, public funding uh, donors. So you don't have much investment from the government as mentioned earlier, because it's an environment and nature conservation is not a priority. You don't have much uh, support from uh, private philanthropic donors, usual private philanthropic donors in the country, maybe because of the history of failed project in Papua New Guinea and being known as a very, very challenging place to operate. Um, but you do have um, uh, several uh, bilateral, multilateral uh, public donors that you can, that, um, that are providing funding for conservation. So we were relying on all the, the one on the screen to fund our program. Uh, I guess one of the challenge with that is that it's, it's restricted funding. It comes with a lot of, um, requirements regarding eligible and ineligible expenses regarding reporting, visibility, communication, et cetera. Um, and when, when, because all the work is about engaging with communities, one of the, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the very important um, thing to do when you engage with communities to engage over the long term, time to build a relationship, uh, time to uh, achieve some of the outcomes, uh, so it's not something you can do usually in one year, two years, three years time frame of a, a usual project. So that, that I think that this uh, uh, risk, the, the, the restrictivity aspect of the funding and the fact that we needed more long term flexible um, support uh, to be provided to these communities was 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 a, was a challenge to to deal with. So the solution. So as I mentioned, land ownership is is kind of unique for for. In Papua New Guinea, it's also a huge opportunity because even if the government might have different priorities than uh, uh, conservation or environment or climate change adaptation, uh, or not enough funding or capacity or reach to go to all these communities, um, the community themselves actually they see um, the impact of uh, degradation of natural resources, of overexploitation, of climate change, and they some of them want to do something about it, and they actually can on their own, because they are the land owners, they actually own the resources um, uh, on their land. So the forest, the sea, the reef, the fish. Um, they, so, so partnering with these communities that have interest uh, in, 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 in ensuring the sustainability of their resources uh, around their village, uh, I think is a very, very practical solution that you can implement in, in, in Papua New Guinea. Some of the things to be careful about when you do that is to uh, make sure that you identify communities that have um, interests that align with you, so with conservation, when you, you work with the conservation NGO. Also being very clear at the beginning, I saw that someone worked at uh, Crater Mountain uh, with WCS, so probably a lot of um, experience there to share. Um, be very clear on the expectation. Um, what, so what we usually do when we, enter a community, a new community is starting by explaining what is WCS, what we can do, and also what we cannot do, because sometimes you, uh, you go to communities that have not seen any government um, extension service or development partner coming uh, to their place, and they have so many needs, such as road, access to markets, education, health, etc. cetera. Um, and, and obviously, uh, there is not being a conservation NGO, you, you bring some, some aspect of it, but uh, not all. So being very clear on the expectation, 
Working with communities that are already organized is also easier. So some of them have community-based organization, have set up community-based organization, which facilitate the implementation of the, of the project. Um, and then starting also, what we were doing it to, is to start with, um, with um, uh, FPIC, so free and prior informed consent. So every time we were starting a new project somewhere in, 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 a, in a village, um, we were explaining what is this project, what are the goals, etc., and then getting all the clans to agree uh, on the on the project and gave their consent before the, the team um, um, start implementing the project with, alongside the community. Obviously, most of our, our, our WCS staff were from Papua New Guinea and even more from the, the province or from the district or from even the, the, the tribe that we were working with which facilitate uh, the, the, the communication, because as mentioned, every, um, so many groups have different languages, so many different languages um, in, in Papua New Guinea. One of the tools we were um, providing them, um, we were supporting them with the, conservation, with the establishment of conservation deeds. So some of these communities, both on land and on, on, on coastal communities, but mostly actually communities that own forest, um, they were interested in um, establishing community conservation areas for two reasons. One, in the, in the highlands, the, the community leaders, the indigenous leaders, they were coming to us and they, they were telling us the story that when they used to go to the forest with their parents, with their father, um, and now um, 40 years later, they can see the big difference in terms of uh, uh, wildlife and also how far the forest is from the village and degradation. And they, they wanted to do something about it. Uh, they can see the pressure that the growing population is having on their limited natural resources. Um, they wanted to have this community conservation area. Uh, one of the challenges is that the legal framework at the national level is, is not very strong for establishing protected areas. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the government doesn't have the capacity also to reach all these communities. Um, so there has been experience of establishing national protected areas, but it took uh, 30 years um, for, the last, um, for the last one um, to, to be established. And even once established, there's still um, um, lack of enforcement um, on, on, on the rules of the protected areas. So one of the tools we were suggesting to these communities to use uh, is conservation deeds. Uh, and conservation deeds are a contract. Uh, and they, they, they work because, as I mentioned earlier, the Constitution of Papua New Guinea uh, recognizes customary land ownership. So, customary land owner, uh, customary land is, is kind of a private property. So, for our land owners, as private owners, they can enter into contracts among themselves. So, several clans will, uh, that own uh, together a forest can. Can, can discuss discuss on, uh, on the contract that they will all sign together. That's the conservation deed. Um, so it protects the rights and customary landowners to make decisions among themselves over the land and the seas, I mentioned before, uh, over the use and management of their resources. Um, and it protects uh, parties from interfer interference by others. So as mentioned, there was two main reasons. The first one was this growing pressure from, um, from the from the community um, because of agriculture, because of uh, production of food and, and hunting, et cetera, over the, 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 the forest resources of the community. The other reason for establishing a for, for communities to establish conservation deed um, was in was in Manus, uh, another province where we're working, an island north of mainland, where there uh, the community, the indigenous communities um, and clans were threatened by um, foreign company, logging company, trying to access their timber. Um, and some of them didn't want the companies to have access to, to their land, uh, but they were struggling to keep them away. So they were uh, working on conservation deeds to strengthen the, the, the legal recognition that this land, the clans, the landowner have decided it, it's a no-go for logging. So it, it can be used in court if it's, um, it's, if it's breached by a, uh, um, um, foreign entity outsider. The deed is uh, it's not 30 years to, 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 to develop, um, but it takes some time. Uh, we, we have experienced two years, one year for, for some, but yeah, between one and two years, 
um, because there is a need to explain what is a deed to the to remote communities. We brought a lawyer so the community can really understand, ask questions about the, the different aspect of the deed. Um, again, through a free and prior informed consent, we, we started this process. Um, the, the, the deed will be prepared by the committee, so they will do the participatory mapping, identify the threats to their resources, the possible rules, uh, identify possible penalties, um, and then prepare the deed consent, review the draft deed within the community, and finally uh, do the signing of the deed. That's one example of deed uh, that uh, the team did for a queer community in the highlands of uh, Papua New Guinea, where you can see, I'm not, I'm not sure if you can see, but that's uh, several clan leaders, uh, several clans coming together, um, eight of them uh, who agree on certain rules over the, the use of their forest um, with dispute resolution mechanism, governance structure, etc. That's the that's the community conservation area that they established through this conservation deed. Uh, that was actually signed uh, in August, uh, end of August uh, this year. Uh, by all the clans, all these clans, uh, and with um, uh, local government, government being witness, and also surrounding communities being witness, uh, because they share the external boundary with other um, indigenous tribes. So being witness of the of the signature of this deed. They have three main zones. The zone one is a, is a no tech area. Zone two is um, um, uh, sustainable uh, use areas, or for instance, they don't use dog anymore to go hunting. They don't go, they don't use um, um, firearm, just traditional practice to go hunting in this uh, area, the zone two. Uh, zone three is uh, settlement area. It's uh, roughly a 4,000 um, hectare uh, community conservation area that has been established uh, through this process. Conservation did is only for limited period of time because contract cannot be um, unlimited uh, in time. So this one is seven years, you can do up to seven, uh, this one is five years, you can do up to seven years. And then the communities sit down again and discuss, and if they, they want, they can renew it um, or, or revise it and, and, and uh, adopt it again. Something that we, one of the solutions also, as I mentioned before, some of these communities are very remote with the, basically no government service or development partner service coming to them. So there, there are lots of needs. Um, and also when an um, outsider, like a logging company, uh, try to have access to their land, even if they, they know that the, even if they know that the practice of the logging companies are um, unsustainable um, and, and leaves um, destruction for, for their land and their rivers, um, and even their community regarding a social context, uh, sometimes they don't even have the choice because they, are, they, they want the royalties or maybe some of the permanent housing that the logging company can promise um, or some of the roads, even that logging roads usually after one season it's washed away uh, once the logs are out. Um, but we were trying to provide um, alternative source of income to alleviate this, this this pressure on the community to uh, accept any deal with an uh, outsider and also as an alternative source of income to uh, provide more incentive to be engaged in, um, in the conservation deed activity, for instance. One example was the support to um, cash, um, conservation cash crop such as vanilla, conservation compatible cash crop such as vanilla growing around their, their gardens at the border of the forest and um, so support to, to to the growing the production, but also linking that to international markets where they can get a better price for their uh, vanilla. Um, another example is at the bottom is the, um, with communities along the coast uh, was to help them um, deploy fish aggregating devices. Uh, and uh, the reason there was that these devices, once kind of floaters and rope, they will attract pelagic fish closer to the village so the, the, the community can, can fish those and uh, provide um, additional source of protein and income for these communities that are engaged also in the, um, managed marine areas, uh, locally managed marine areas establishment. Uh, finally, one more example is the in the highlands, we had a, we, the WCS has a 
tree nursery program. So working with the communities to identify what are the propagation methods for uh, the native trees in the highlands. So nobody knew how to propagate this, uh, these uh, tree species, so native tree species, 11 of them. Um, the BCS managed to uh, identify the propagation method, train the, the locals on how to grow the, the, the seed and then the, the seedlings in the, in the nursery and then plant that into woodlots uh, with the hope that it will provide a source of wood, timber, um, for their houses, for instance, and alleviate the, the, the pressure on the, on, the, on the forest. I told you about uh, Manus, where there was this um, issue with um, in, uh, logging happening um, over the land of the community. So we work with uh, partners such as Watchdog and Geo. We documented with, with, who exposed uh, some of the some of the practice uh, that were happening um, in Manus. We also worked with uh, um, local NGO lawyers that are specialized in um, building the capacity of, uh, of local community uh, around their legal rights. So they were doing a lot of this legal work, rights workshop uh, in, the, in the village. So people can, because people do have the ownership of the land, but sometimes they don't know all the all the, all the legal rights that they have. So just educating them about what are your rights, um, what are the uh, responsibility of the um, logging company, for instance, what are they supposed to do as part of the law, such as free and prior informed consent, what kind of document they can sign with you. So at least they have all uh, the information to make the best decision um, they want for their community. Uh, so that, that was one example in, 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 in Manus. Um, along the coast, um, we were doing also these uh, small scale community based marine management areas, a similar process than the one I explained for the forest. Uh, but we were trying to bring that one step further, um, especially because the ecological, um, the, ecolog the meaningful ecological scale for marine areas is, is quite, for many species, is quite large areas. So then you cannot achieve that by focusing on, on, on the uh, um, area, fishing area of one village or two or three village, you need to, to work at a bigger scale. So we were working with 100, the, the team is still working with 100 communities in New Ireland province, um, and also with the government, we made a commitment to establish a large marine protected area, um, roughly 1 million hectare, probably the, the largest in Papua New Guinea, um, to, um, with, with the main objective not necessarily being conservation, but being food security, because most of these communities, they rely on the reefs and seagrass and mangroves, surrounding mangroves for, for their um, livelihoods. But they, again, they see the decline of these resources because of population growth, because of um, also competition with a more large scale fishing, um, because of outsider also accessing their reefs. So they, they, they wanted to put some rules to, to promote the sustainable use, um, the sustainability of their fish stock, fish, fish uh, resources over the long term. Uh, and they are doing that through the marine protected area at a, at a large scale. Here, yeah, that's a, a community also in New Ireland province, one example of a community in New Ireland province that we were supporting. They live in, so there's a few houses on this island uh, with sea level rise, climate change impact. Uh, as you can imagine, they are losing ground. Um, and one of the, solution they are implementing uh, on their own, but that we were also supporting through a mangrove nursery program um, is to grow uh, and plant uh, mangrove around their, um, along the coast and around the houses to reduce coastal erosion. So that's something you can see a lot actually when you, you move uh, from island to island in this place, uh, how they try to adapt because most of them, when you sit on the, limit between the sea and the, 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 the land with the elders, they can tell you, oh, actually here where we where I, I used to play there when I was younger, but the, the sea was actually starting 50 meters away. Uh, so they already saw a lot of reduction of their land over the past uh, few decades. Uh, and it's still, with sea level rise, they still um, have a need to um, try to reduce coastal region as much as they can to adapt to the impact of climate change through, um, for instance, mangrove planting around their uh, house. Just checking on the time, uh, maybe quickly. 
the um, one, one other uh, example of the work we are doing is to work with the national government on uh, improving the on rental impact assessment process for roads um, because um, there is a lot of um, uh, road development plans in place, uh, but not necessarily with enough um, feasibility studies that have been conducted, uh, both economically uh, and to address the economical, social, or mental impacts of these uh, road um, development plans. Um, and, and so we were working with the government to help them better prioritize uh, which road will make more sense in terms of, um, uh, of balancing uh, uh, economic and, and mental impacts. Um, with one of the recommendations also being that most likely the maintenance of existing road network procedure really, really, really by chip will uh, probably be a, a very smart economical, um, economically uh, move because um, you, you can already uh, have a big impact in terms of, um, for instance, flow of coffee or different uh, mining products out of PNG through this existing uh, in addition to uh, local communities having, having access to markets and the school, et cetera, through this existing network. Not saying, obviously, that they do not need to expand their road network, they, 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 they need to expand their road, but to working with the government to make that happen as, um, as um, in, a, in the best way possible. Finally, a uh, last incentive that we, um, last solution we were trying to uh, implement is uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the lack of funding for conservation natural resource management activities, sustainable natural resource management activity was a big constraint. Uh, that was for NGO like a wildlife conservation society. Uh, it was even more for local groups that might struggle uh, uh, more to have access to outside funding, public funding, et cetera. Um, so we were working with the government and the UN on the United Nations on the red plus readiness, so the reducing, redu reducing emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, deforestation and land degradation program. We are also um, working with the government on establishing a conservation trust fund. Um, the idea was to bring, um, to get, to, do, to set up independent legal um, entity that will um, attract um, investment or uh, contribution from uh, donors and then uh, pull that into a trust fund and use the interest to then disburse through grants um, over the long time uh, to local community, local community groups, local NGOs, local governments all around the country. I guess that's probably the biggest opportunity in Papua New Guinea at least at the moment is using this energy and this uh, enthusiasm um, and this commitment that many, many groups around the countries, many communities, um, and local, local NGOs have to better manage their natural resources or protect some of their forests or seas. Um, but they need, they need support. Uh, they need funding, they need capacity building and through this conservation trust fund. Um, once it's established, that would be one avenue to be able to provide uh, more of this um, small funding that can help these groups to, to, to implement their project and, and, and support their, their capacity building to be in better position to manage their uh, forest or marine resources over, over the long term. I will stop there. I'm happy to, to, to talk about any of those topics more in the discussion. So the, if you want to know more about the um, program of the Wildlife Conservation Society in Papua New Guinea. That's the website here at the bottom. Uh, and that's uh, my, uh, also my email address. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amboise. Really fascinating presentation. And I'm amazed at how you were able to educate us so effectively on the country in such a short period of time. So thank you for your presentation. Really appreciate that. Um, I think if you click to stop sharing your screen that um, people will be able to see. Yeah, there we go. They can see us um, in greater detail. If you have questions, please place your questions in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. We have a number of questions already. Um, we're gonna have a, a, a conversation um, with all of you. 
based on the kinds of questions that we have here. Um, the first one is about the conservation deed. So uh, you very neatly summarized what seems like a really complicated and sophisticated uh, system of creating deeds and getting a wide variety of groups with different interests and different land use priorities to agree on these deeds. Um, someone wanted to know if, if the conservation deeds are recognized by the national government of Papua New Guinea. It's not yet recognized as, for instance, the um, outcome of the conservation deed. So, for instance, the community conservation area, the protected area that the community will establish, because the deeds are only five to seven years and then renewable, uh, renegotiable. Um, it's not it's not part of the national protected area register. It's not not inside the database. Um, it's more. Um, um, IUCN got uh, special terms for other uh, area-based conservation measures, um, but not necessarily part of the national uh, protected area registry. Um, yet, because because the um, but it, it does exist in several parts of the, the the country. So there was one in Ma in uh, Madang established, I think, at least ten years ago, um, um, and, and that the government is aware of. So it's not part of the protected area registry, but still um, it's, it's recognized in the way that um, if the community go to court, if anyone breach whatever uh, rules they are put in the, 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 the deed, including the government, they, they can go to court uh, and challenge um, the, the breach of the, the contract by the outside the government or companies or another landowner from another part of, or within their community. Um, so it, it can be, because they are the landowners, they can make decision over the uh, resources, over the land. Uh, it's actually recognized by the court. I'm glad you brought that up because that was gonna be my next question. To what extent um, are these deeds really enforceable and, and how well are they enforced? And for example, you gave us the, um, the map that had the, the different zones and showing that in certain zones, uh, it's residential, essentially, in other zones. Um, hunting is allowed, but you have to use traditional methods of hunting. How easy is it to enforce for um, someone is, you know, someone's in a zone and they're not hunting according to the traditional methods? I know that's an issue in other, you know, for example, in the Amazon, you have all kinds of um, sort of negative actors that are not following the rules, but because it's a forest and it's thick, it's very difficult to, to find out who's doing it and to, to really enforce the policies. So curious about that. So the, the committees, they also have the village courts always dealing with um, a local aspect of uh, justice or enforcement, etc. Um, they have their customary laws, or they're used to uh, basically deal with um, enforcement um, at, the, at the local level on their own. Um, um, so there's no rangers from the government coming to this place, that, 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 no, no such things. But because the, because the land is owned by these tribes and clans, uh, one tribe and eight clans, for instance, for Quiyop in the highlands, that came together because that's their initiative. They wanted this conservation area. We just provided the tool and the support and the funding, et cetera, capacity building, but they wanted to have this in place. So they, they came up together, all the, all the leaders from all these clans to discuss what could be the rules, what could be the, the, the demarcation. So then we, we went with them, we did some GPS, um, training and then we we work with them the team work with them all around the demarcation of their land because they are, as i mentioned the land is not land boundaries are not surveyed but we, we help them do that so it was a it's also an incentive for them to have their land better recognized especially if their land disputes with neighboring communities um, but they are the one who decide on rules collectively so in the end i believe even the the, deed, the the document for those kind of committees are not even needed because they, it's all an internal process. They decided on these rules, they decided on these zones, uh, and, and um, we just facilitated the process. So 
they, they, they will enforce among themselves. Um, I think the challenge is when it's um, there is a bridge from someone from outside, like like uh, I explained for Manus communities, where they have this um, interest from logging company coming from outside. Then I guess the the document itself is also is quite important because they they can they can um, potentially go to court to um, to challenge uh, some of the activities from outsider that are uh, uh, in, uh, oppo uh, that are not aligned with the content of the deed. Yet uh, we didn't I didn't experience that kind of um, uh, uh, step yet because we just um, completed the process of signing the deed this year uh, with these communities in Manus and the Highlands. So I haven't seen yet how they can use the deed in, in practice. I know it's possible, but in practice, I, haven't, I do not have the experience yet of using the deed uh, in court to challenge uh, activity from someone from outside. Well, and what's, what's really amazing about this example is also the way in which it privileges the priorities of the indigenous communities. You know, I think there aren't so many good models in place globally that allow the indigenous communities to have a decision-making role in even the ideas and concepts that um, that are put in place to help conserve their resources. So it's it can't be it can't be understated. You know what a fascinating example this is, and and how important it is for this issue of conservation of. Um, of areas that are deeply affected by climate change and, and also areas that are um, preserves of um, native species, plants, and cultural ways of life that are not found anywhere else on the planet. Um, I wanna go to a question that, that somewhat ties to that, which is just recognizing that, um, that the country may be rich in resources and rich in culture, but um, its income and access to medical care is tied to uh, extractive industries or agriculture. And uh, the question is really knowing that these kind of mining, logging, agriculture can degrade the environment, what are alternatives pr for providing income and improvement to the lives of the people living in Papua New Guinea? Um, the person asking the question said, for example, is tourism an alternative that, that they could consider for developing income? Um, so the alternative, so first of all, the, 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 there's looking at not necessarily bad or extractive industries uh, in general, uh, it's just the way uh, some of them operate in the country, um, disregarding the sustainable practice, disregarding the law that is in place. So for instance, logging, there is a sustainable logging code of practice that all the logging companies are supposed to comply with, uh, which leave the land for 30 years before you come back to harvest trees and you, you can just harvest some of them. Uh, I don't talk about all the details, but there is a sustainable code uh, of practice for logging in the country. And if all the companies were complying with that, uh, it, it would be um, done sustainably. The issue is that some of the companies are actually, uh, circum uh, are actually bypassing the law uh, and using some of the loopholes such as the, um, forest, forest clearance authority, which gives a right to a company to have access to a land, clear, to clear the land, to clear fill all the, the trees, to plant uh, then rubber or oil palm, so for agriculture purpose at the end, uh, which can then bring uh, sustainable income if done properly for the communities there over the long time. Um, and so the, the logging is not the aim there, it's the, the, the plantation and running of, um, of um, cash crops. Yet, uh, because when you go through this process, you don't have to comply with any sustainable logging practice. Actually, the company used this to have access to the land and to the trees and the timber and to extract uh, the timbers quickly um, without uh, following the sustainable code of practice for logging. Uh, and then they actually do not uh, plant the, the cash crops. So um, it's just uh, a trick to have access to, to the land of these indigenous groups. Um, 
Same with extractive industries, the, the, the footprint can be quite small for some of them, but hopefully the indirect impact can, can be big with migration, etc. cetera. Um, agriculture uh, is already big in, in, in but more subsistence uh, family farming is really, really, really big in, in Papua New Guinea. Um, so improving the productivity so, so of, of their, of their um, land uh, could be also an alternative, uh, not an alternative, but an option, enhancing currently uh, current livelihood. Uh, tourism. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Papua New Guinea, as I mentioned at the beginning, is an amazing place. So um, people say that once you've been to Papua New Guinea, uh, if you like the kind of uh, wildlife, authentic um, uh, trip uh, for outsiders, then it ruins all your future trip because you, you cannot beat what you experience in, in, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, but at the same time, it's also got a bad press about um, uh, travel fights, security issues, etc. As I mentioned, uh, the cost of going around in Papua New Guinea is really expensive. So tourism is not really developed at the moment, but could be uh, in, in the future. Mm. Okay, I want to go to a number of, of people speaking about population growth um, that you identified as a problem and wondering um, if there is uh, an, an agenda on the part of Wildlife Conservation Society or um, if there are programs that help educate women to address um, population growth. Yes, there are several um, um, NGOs so that was not part of our main um, activity, but uh, there, there were um, several NGOs or groups uh, focusing on educating uh, uh, women with family planning. Um, and we had, a, before I left, we were uh, running a project in collaboration with um, other groups uh, funded by USAID. Um, focusing also on empowering women uh, through uh, economic activities. So not necessarily family planning, but uh, trying to provide um, economic alternatives or economic opportunities to, to women and strengthen their role in the natural resource management decision-making. Uh, so yes, there are groups um, that are working on that and definitely helping uh, women uh, with uh, one, family planning, and two, uh, having access to education and, and keeping them longer in the school system is definitely also uh, uh, something important for, for, for the development of the person uh, and indirectly also for uh, um, limiting or controlling population growth. Well, I, I'm glad you made those points because people often sort of think directly about contraception being the answer um, but a lot of the data points to, as you've said, that um, when women are educated, when they're provided with employment opportunities or opportunities for personal development, that has a direct impact on um, family planning, decision-making, on empowerment for women so that they have a greater control over the size of their families and the timing of, um, of becoming mothers. So it's, it's really wonderful to see that there is a, a sort of a balanced understanding of the importance of education and, and employment opportunities. Um, all right, we've got some really specific questions. Uh, I wanna go to Richard's question. Are you aware of any research or evaluation of the impact of subsea mine mill tailings disposal from the Mesima gold mine on the near shore ecology of the south coast of Mesima Island? Uh, short answer is no. Uh, I know that there was some uh, deep sea mining project happening offshore uh, New Ireland province. Uh, I'm not sure there was research happening, but there was um, a strong movement from the uh, indigenous group um, that were the owners actually of these um, seas. I mean, it's kind of challenging because it's offshore sea. So the, the customary ownership of uh, local communities, how far it extends to um, offshore waters is, is, is not totally clear from a legal standpoint. Um, but there was a lot of protest from some of these uh, indigenous communities groups 
uh, around uh, this project, which is deep sea mining project. Uh, I think it was stopped uh, at least when I was there. But regarding the um, ecological impact, I'm sure there is some research um, worldwide, but specifically in Papua New Guinea, uh, not, not that I'm aware of. And Richard also would like to know what has been the impact of the Exxon gas export project on patterns of land use within the project area that you presented on? Over patterns of land use? I think one of the, so again, extractive industry compared to logging or large scale plantation can have a very tiny direct impact on forest cover, but they will have huge impacts in terms of social impact first because of um, maybe I mean, social impact uh, and also uh, because of uh, migration coming, also opening of new roads uh, to have access to the minerals or to the, to the, uh, yeah, to the minerals. Um, will also open access for others to, to come in this um, before um, virgin area. Uh, so one of the one of the one of big danger of opening new roads in intact forest, for instance, is that it uh, it will it will open um, the opportunity for instance logging company to have access to new to new areas. Um, so the indirect impact uh, from migration, from uh, opening the access to other uh, extractive industries, is probably the the, the largest one. Uh, there is also, uh, I'm, I haven't been specifically to this place, but there is also a positive uh, impacts for the royalties and benefits uh, to the communities, uh, employment uh, that they receive from the from the gas project. Um, the government is also relying a lot on on the the tax over this um, gas project or the, the revenue from this tax uh, project for the overall budget. Um, the, the Excel in particular, they have this uh, big biodiversity program that they, they established, um, which um, supported training in the, um, in the university for community-based conservation worker, uh, and also bringing all these conservation groups that were working all around the, the Papua New Guinea together to discuss some of the issues. Um, so that they were organized that kind of uh, workshop. They were giving grants also to some groups to um, uh, establish protective community conservation areas or, or manage existing uh, protected areas. Um, so I haven't been specifically to this place, so it's difficult for me to say. I would say that direct impact is quite limited, but indirect is huge. Uh, and it's not only, um, negative impact, there's also some positive impact, even though we could probably argue that there is a mismatch between the scale of the benefits that are that the, the company is getting out of this um, um, gas project and the benefits for the for the local communities. Um, but probably development is not happening at the scale that was expected when the project started around the, around the mine. Okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, Michael wants to know about um, propagating trees to repopulate parts of the forest. How long does it take to uh, for native trees to reach maturity and become useful to the indigenous people? That's a, that's a very good question. That was actually one of the big challenges we were facing with this um, project. So it's, I mean, one of the objective was to repopulate forest. The other one was just to uh, establish woodlots close to the house, so in the garden area, um, so the, 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 that they can use the wood for, for building the house. So most of the houses are built from uh, timber from the forest, uh, but they can't actually find this uh, timber anymore. Um, so the, we were propagating these native tree species to bring that closer to their place, but it takes time. Uh, and usually, I mean, it's challenging to keep the, the community highly motivated uh, for over, I think some of them were um, 20 years to reach maturity. Um, and they do, have, um, they do have alternatives. So most of the trees uh, that are planted are eucalyptus, eucalyptus and pine uh, tree species um, because they grow fast. 
so most of the tree planting is using uh, in, in Papua New Guinea is using these two species, but uh, it's it's not native species. It's actually invasive species. That's why we're not promoting those, uh, but instead promoting their own native species. Uh, they didn't know how to propagate those in the highlands, uh, so that was one of the first obstacles to to deal with. Uh, but there's still this issue, and, and the timber from these native species is really uh, high value, but uh, it's true, there's, um, there's it is issue of a uh, long time frame before they reap the benefit of their effort uh, to them. Okay, I want to go to, um, actually someone emailed us earlier in anticipation of your presentation, um, Patrick. Uh, from Vancouver, who wants to know about um, some experience that he had working in, in Papua New Guinea in 1967 with the Australia Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organization. This was before the independence of the country. And he says, we studied watershed um, of the Fly River to advise on future development of the area at that time, the Fly River was a beautiful and almost pristine system. Um, in the meantime, a Canadian-Australian mining consortium had demolished the river by failing to design and operate a safe tailing pond dam. And he wants to know if you have any information on restoration of the Fly River, if you know anything about that area. Uh, no, sorry, I don't. Um, I know there is now this. Uh, big, then when I was there, there was this um, this project happening, this mining project plan um, upstream the Sipic River, uh, and obviously uh, the the people fighting that that were against this, including some of these uh, landowners around the the Sipic, um, were pointing out to the previous bad experience with the, with the Fly River mine. Um, but I, I don't know how uh, this part of the Papua New Guinea, how the restoration took place and um, what has been the impact. Just know that it's still an issue and then there are still some projects in other rivers that similar projects that happen in other rivers. Hope, hopefully they will uh, be more careful, but um, um, yeah, I don't know specifically about the, the Fly River restoration program. So in your, um, a lot of your slides showed some really beautiful pictures of birds. And we know that Papua New Guinea is, um, is one of the places. I mean, you, uh, you sort of alluded to it <clears throat> when you said if you're a wildlife enthusiast and you go um, for tourism in Papua New Guinea, you probably are gonna be disappointed anywhere else you go. And I wonder if you could just comment on um, some of these issues with conservation, how is it affecting the native wildlife? You know, we're, we've been talking a lot on the communities and their survival and their welfare, but I'm curious if there, um, if you have information on, for example, bird species and endemic species to the area and how they are affected. So as mentioned, there's not that many successful conservation projects in protected areas in particular in, in, in Papua New Guinea. So this, um, the, the, there are these more small scale community based conservation projects that are probably more successful. Uh, getting information, long term monitoring program in place to actually detect the trend in wildlife and how the, the protection and the, what has been the impact of the protection on the um, population of wildlife is, is kind of rare. So I know that there was such programs uh, in two protected areas or community based conservation areas um, focusing on tree kangaroos, not supported by WCF, but other groups, uh, where there are some good data about um, sh um, um, showing an increase in the, in the presence of uh, tree kangaroos in the, in the protected site. We did put in place also a monitoring program, but that was, I mean, we did that over the past two years, so it was too early to, to detect any trend yet, uh, and because the conservation did were kind of new also, signed just a, uh, a few months ago for one of them. Um, so putting some um, uh, um, um, camera, I'm not sure how you call that, um, camera trap, sorry, um, a grid of camera trap in this forest to, to document uh, uh, wildlife, but uh, it was 
only the beginning. So uh, not difficult, not easy to to detect scientifically uh, uh, population trend in wildlife due uh, to the that we can link to the impact of the protection uh, project in place. There, you do have a lot of anecdote, anecdotal evidence from the indigenous uh, leaders that are uh, working on these projects that um, for their communities, uh, they, they do say that uh, you, thanks to the, the effort of the communities in reducing hunting or protecting uh, a particular place of the forest, they can actually see um, uh, more and more species, including species that they uh, didn't see for a very long time, um, but it's more anecdotal uh, evidence that um, um, scientific paper that um, that were um, published on this. Well, you bring up the connection between the local people and the Wildlife Conservation Society, and you know the conversation that happens back and forth. And someone wanted to know what is what is their understanding really of why. Uh, WCS is motivated to help them, or or how does WCS explain their reason for giving support? How does the community just really understand why this organization is coming in and wanting to work with them? Um, that's a critical question, and um, that's actually something not easy to do, uh, just to explain uh, what WCS is doing and why we, we were keen on working with them. Um, there are a lot of expectations when, uh, when a development partner, conservation groups or other enter a village, a remote place, uh, that you, you will bring development to the place. Uh, so we have to be very careful to explain what, what, what. so we had a very basic, presentation that the, the, the local staff were given to the, to the communities on what is the BCS, what we can do, and also what we cannot do um, to make it very clear to the community. It, it, but it, it was taking several meetings before uh, being able to clearly explain um, what we were doing. For instance, conservation doesn't have any meaning um, for, for people in, in, in Papua New Guinea. So we were framing uh, more on sustainable natural resources. Uh, and because more and more communities actually see the impact of the growing population of uh, extractive industries over, over their natural resources over the, on, on their land, they're actually more responsive to that kind of um, um, discussion. But it depends where you go. So if you go in big, huge hotspots in the middle of nowhere, so very, very remote places, um, you will actually be in places that are very important in terms of biodiversity, but are not yet threatened. You do have people living there, but their footprint is kind of low. So if you, so we are not really targeting this community. We are more working communities at the uh, border or the frontier between uh, uh, um, intensive land use. And so where, where there are pressure uh, threaten, threats happening on, on their resources. But if you go to these um, more um, pristine places, uh, it would be highly challenging to, to talk about conservation because the sustainability, they, they don't see that what all they see is uh, endless forest around them with plenty of resources. So um, bringing this concept of uh, affinity of the natural resources and so sustainability uh, will be a challenge in those places. So just as a follow up to that, that would seem to imply that there's a bit less sort of interaction between different groups. In other words, there's not sort of a chain of communication that passes its way um, throughout the country amongst groups that they really can be very isolated from each other. Is that the case? Yes, this is true. So for instance, one, one of the island where we're working, Manus, uh, you can go on a banana, banana boat, which is a small boat, um, maybe with an outside engine, maybe four hours you go around. It's a very small boat, four hours you go around. And so in this, in this island, uh, 60 different languages are spoken. So, and yet people are close by, right? But they, uh, the interaction between the different groups is, is, is limited. Um, it's 
it's there, but it's limited. That's why you, you got so many languages spoken still um, in, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, okay. Um, I, I, Mary, Mary kind of gives a follow up to the last question that I asked, and she says, I'm seeing the beautiful people pictured who appear to be nourished by the ecosystem in which they live. Are they aware of what they stand to lose from development? Um. I think they see development uh, very positively. They want development for their place, for the children. They want to have access to roads and markets and a better health system and education. So development is, is a good thing. Um, I guess it's how they go there, the issue. Um, Again, so I think some of these committees that are seeing day to day the impact of um, unsuitable practices on their natural resources are more uh, aware of uh, what they are, what what they what they might lose if it continues on that trend. Um, on the, from the, for instance, on the these addresses and we call that villas in in Papua New Guinea. They're using a lot of uh, um, uh, wildlife. Um, so for instance, bird of paradise, feathers and uh, wildlife pellets, but um, uh, fur, um, which is now more and more challenging to, to get. So they see also the, the connection between the, the, the use of uh, wildlife and their uh, culture. Um, so one of the project we had is actually to try to extend the, 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 the lifespan of these um, dresses. Uh, with animal parts in it, um, because the study showed that you have to renew um, some of these parts every, I don't know, five years, maybe I can't remember exactly, but you need to renew some of these uh, parts in your address. Um, and because they were basically stored here in a randomly in the house and, 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 and eaten by uh, insects and mold, etc. So we're providing better package that, um, um, preserve these uh, villas for a longer time, so they do not need to go back to the, to the hunter or to the forest to get um, new parts of uh, birds or animals to, to, put, uh, to, 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 um, um, to put back in their villas. So that was one of the activities. But yes, yeah, some of them see the, the link, uh, but probably um, um, not, not all of them. Such a simple thing. To, that could be a conservation project, right? A, a way to store your regalia so that you don't have to renew it so frequently. It's, it's a, you know, fascinating that such a simple thing could make a, a big impact. Um, I wanna go to one of our last remaining questions from John, who wants to know if agriculture companies could develop projects on land that's previously been logged by the logging companies. So a sort of rotating land rather than clearing more land. I guess it, it could be the case. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not happening. Maybe because the, the, the land is, um, I mean, the, the how you call that? The fertility of the soil is, is not good anymore because the forest has been gone for too long. Uh, maybe some invasive species have um, um, covered it. Um, and because of uh, soil erosion, land being washed uh, through the rivers uh, and losing their, 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 their top productive, their top uh, fertile soil. Uh, maybe also because of, um, so as I mentioned before, some of these companies actually use these mechanisms to set up, they will plant, so the end goal is to plant cash crops, but it's actually not happening, just the login. So that, that's one of the reasons. Another reason is lack of coordination between, um, between uh, the different government bodies. So agriculture, forest, conservation, they, they, they are not speaking to each other. Uh, I guess it's similar to many countries where there is lack of, uh, cross-sectoral coordination. Um, and finally, the, the, land, the extreme land uh, ownership fractionalization or um, mosaic that uh, I talk about with, uh, so if you want to have a plantation of a large uh, scale, uh, you 
you, you will have to engage with uh, many, many, many different groups uh, to convince them uh, about, their pro about your project, um, cash crop project. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's something really challenging to do. Well, and, and on that point, Marin asks about a common language um, because you talked about how many different groups there are and how many different languages are spoken. Are there communication obstacles just to getting people to come together because they don't, they literally don't speak a common language? Is there a, is there a sort of a national language across Papua New Guinea that allows them to communicate? Yes, they do. And most of them speak also the the top place, which is their um, basically the language from their place, top place. Uh, and then they got um, uh, the top PC, which is the national language. And also some of them speak English too. This has been a great conversation. We've got, we've gone through a lot of questions um, and I wanna leave time for you to uh, make any closing remarks. And I'd also just love to hear about you, you know, you have the unique experience of being a Greenberg fellow during the pandemic year. And um, what was your time like during your fellowship at Yale? And what kinds of experiences did you um, pick up that you would take back to the work that you do now? Uh, thank you, Lorraine, and all for the invitation. It was great to interact with this, uh, uh, with your group. And um, you again, uh, reminds me of this time last year uh, when I was the uh, Green Bay Year World Fellow. So it was a particular time to join the, we, we, we have been called the COVID cohort. So basically the campus was closed, so not much interaction with uh, faculty and students and um, the library was open, so I had the chance to visit the library, which was uh, fantastic. Um, but just, yeah, I think compared to what were my objective when I joined the, the program and what I actually got out of it. So when I came, uh, I was really interested to interact a lot with the Yale community and uh, learn, take new classes, learn uh, new things around the leadership and new things around the conservation finance, et cetera, all of this, did, I mean, some of it happened. Um, I, I had a very, very interesting course on climate change negotiate, climate change negotiate, international negotiations. Uh, Susan, uh, Sue, uh, I can't remember her name, but really, really great class. Um, and uh, the best part of it actually was the interactions with the other fellows we were, because we were basically living together and interacting um, uh, for all of those that may, were able to join uh, on campus. Some, some of them have to be were remote, but uh, at least 10 of us managed to go to the campus. Uh, so we had a great, great time with these, um, these other fellows and I learned a lot from them, some coming from Africa or Asia or uh, South America, etc. But all of them with a great story that they shared and really strong commitment to make the world a better place. Although everyone was working on different fields, not necessarily environment, but some of them on other issues, human rights, et cetera. Someone from Afghanistan was sharing his story. So really um, inspiring people to be around. Uh, and I really learned a lot uh, from them and um, um, taking that on board when I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing uh, now. Um, so great time when I was a, a World Fellow, even though we were part of the COVID cohort. And I, as a closing remark, so Papua New Guinea, uh, if you, I mean, I know that several of uh, you managed to, to reach Papua New Guinea, um, and I will encourage uh, others to, to try to, to visit this place. It's really amazing place. The people are really friendly. Uh, it's, it's kind of, when you're there, it's more like a, family style all the time. Once you reach the airport, once you reach the authority, once you go in the hotel or with a village in, in the villages, it's really, really welcoming communities and wonderful expense to have to, to expand this place and, 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 and be living with these people uh, for, for some time. So uh, hopefully some of you uh, will be planning to, to go there once the travel resume. Thank you. 
Okay, well, thank you. I, I, that's a wonderful testimony to uh, why it's important and interesting to go there. It's, uh, I certainly learned a lot. I mean, to think about a place in the world that has so many different distinct groups living there, um, indigenous to the place, preserving their language and their cultural traditions and finding creative ways to protect their environment. Um, so thank you so much for this really engaging talk. Thank all of you for your questions. Um, certainly, as you said, Amboise is not a direct conversation about climate change, but this talking about conservation efforts and how we preserve important places of biodiversity like Papua New Guinea is um, very germane to the issue of climate change, uh, central to it. So the work that you've done there, um, really important work. And uh, with that, I invite all of you to please tune in to our next climate change conversation, which will be on Wednesday um, at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And our following one will be on Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So we have two more this week. And if you have any further questions or comments for our Amboise that you have forgotten today, please feel free to contact us um, at our Yale Alumni Academy email address or through our website. Um, thank you again. And thank you, Amboise, for a wonderful talk. See you at the next one. Thank you, Okay. Have a nice, have a nice evening. Bye-bye.